excuse for a party, I say. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll repeat it next week. <laughs> uh, I do want to pray uh, as we... Oh, we're in Malachi chapter 3, picking up where we left off. But I do want to pray for Brian York. He's in the hospital. Um, he's got some issues with his liver. Not really sure what it is. The doctors are not sure. But uh, uh, he's had some, some pain. And he's had some itchy skin. And he's had some issues and uh, some jaundice, some things going on. And uh, they're going to do some more tests tomorrow. See if they can't track down what's going on. But remember him in prayer. Um, that would be great. But let's pray for him as we pray for our study right now. Lord God, we do lift Brian up to you. Uh, Lord, it's good to know he loves you and his uh, hope is in you and figuring out what's going on. And certainly, Lord, he believes that you could just touch him and heal him. And I know he's okay with that, just like we are. <coughs> But Lord, for whatever degree you need intervention that the doctors might discover what is going on, we pray that you would give them wisdom. But Lord, our hope is in you as our great physician. And pray that you would heal our, our brother. Pray, Lord, that you would get him out of the hospital and get him back about doing your business. And Lord, as we look at your word, that you would just speak to us. Give us wisdom. Help us to understand what it is that you would say to us today. And bless our time together. In Jesus' name. So you may remember the book of Malachi is a corrective book. That's always nice. You come and I'm going to give you something to chew on that makes you... Uh, or whatever. Hopefully not. We'll see. But the intent of the book, as Malachi wrote this, was to provoke the nation of Israel, the people of God, back into a proper relationship with him. And as is uh, always a good practice for anybody, but certainly how the Lord brings correction, he begins in chapter 1, verse 2, by saying, I have loved you, says the Lord. He wants to let you know, first of all, I love you. So I want to bring you this correction from that perspective, he would say, that you understand it's for your good, that I encourage you to take these steps, to do these things, because I love you, and I care about you. And it comes through with all the different ways that we've looked at to where we are now in chapter 3 where the Lord through Malachi has been challenging the nation of Israel back into that right relationship with him. And we, we come to Malachi chapter 7, I mean chapter 3 verse 7, and it says, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. We talked about that last time I was here. How the way back, it's a simple step, really. It's return. It's turn around. It's repentance and turning back to God. <coughs> Going back to his way instead of our way. But they said at the end of verse 7, But you said, in what way shall we return? They're like, well, what should we do? What do we have to do? How do we return? And he says in verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Oh boy, why did you come to church today? I'm talking about money. Isn't that a great time, you know? It's a hard thing for any pastor to deal with this topic. I've got a good angle right now. My last week's next week. You know, I have no agenda in this. You know, I've got no, no dog in the fight except that I do. I do. Because, and, and really part of the reason it's so hard, interesting, we went to church last week. <clears throat> my friend Adam, 
down in Fairfield. This was his topic, not this passage. He was in 1 Corinthians, but it's like, okay, Lord, what are you saying to me? What are you trying to tell me? You know, because this is where I am. But if you don't mention giving, you're neglecting part of the Word of God. And that would be an error. And, and the other thing is preventing people from knowing what a blessing there is when we give to the Lord, when we participate in what God is doing. It's such a, 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 an important thing to share. But often, and it's been so abused over so many years, but if you don't mention, I mean, if you do mention it, many times you'll turn some people off. Many times it makes people feel guilty or makes people think that the pastor has some ulterior motive like money, you know, I need money for some project or he wants resources for himself or something like that. So a lot of guys will shy away from this and that's really too bad. You know, my motive, well, it's the next thing. We're just going in order through the book of Malachi. So it's come up. But it's also that the church might thrive and that whoever the Lord sends behind me um, might help him out a little bit too, whoever that may be. But look at how the passage begins in verse 8. Will a man rob God? Have you thought about that? How in the world can you rob God? How do we do that? Doesn't God have and own and in control of everything? Everything does belong to God. Psalm 24 1 says, The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the word, world and those who dwell therein. So it's all God's. Yet, God has given to us all of that that we would say is ours. Everything that we have has come from God. He's allowed us the strength to work. He's allowed us the wisdom we have to do whatever it is that we do. I mean, it's all from His, Him. And from all that God has given us, given to us, there is a portion that God retains from Himself. Tithes and offerings belong to the Lord. They're His. But He gives it to us. And this is God, you know, I think about this as I think of, about how God does it. He gives us everything, but he wants us to trust him, to take a portion of that, to give to the church, to give to the work of the Lord, so that he might be blessed. But he wants us to trust him to be able to do that. And as we do that, how the church is blessed and able to do the ministry that God has called the church to do. And really, it's the church is the people. And it's really a blessing for everybody. So it's a wonderful thing. But will a man rob God? And yet God says, yet you have robbed me. And you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. So what is a tithe? The word in Hebrew that's used here for tithe occurs 32 <clears throat> times in Scripture. 27 times it is rendered as tithe. Twice it's called tenth part. Twice it's rendered tenth. And once it's called tithing. But clearly the word tithe means a tenth. One tenth. Ten percent of our income, ten percent of our assets, they belong to God. It's for His purposes. It belongs to God's house. The other ninety percent still belongs to God, though. It isn't like it is not His. Everything we have belongs to Him. But He allows us to manage that other ninety percent. But the ten percent... He said it belongs to him. 10%. And you look at verse 9. He says, though you are cursed with a curse. You've robbed me, even this whole nation. You've not done that, he says. And so God was not able to bless Israel materially or spiritually because of their neglect in this area. He wanted to do more. He, he desires to do more, but he's hindered from that through disobedience. And I, I get this out of the commentary, just a little short line that I wrote down, but many people with financial problems fail to do the most important thing first, which is to obey and honor God with their resources. It seems counter to... Uh, 
how things would work, doesn't it? I don't have enough, so I can't do that. And I certainly have been there. I know all about that. And I found it really interesting. You know, my friend Adam last week, as he was sharing from 1 Corinthians 16, you know, talking about how it's not just an Old Testament principle. It's not just found in the law. It actually predates the law. Tithing goes all the way back to Adam. I mean, to Abraham. Coming back from the uh, battle where he um, got back all of when Lot was taken, all the goods, all the people, everything, he brought them back. He met this guy named Melchizedek. And I don't want to get into Melchizedek, but we'll be here a long time. But you can read about it in Hebrews chapter 7, read about this guy who had no genealogy. That's interesting. No father, no mother. You know, called it. It's, uh, anyway, there's so much there. Um, many believe that he is a pre-incarnate um, Christ. Jesus, before the incarnation, appearing in the Old Testament, and Abraham met him, and it says Abraham gave him a tithe. That's the first thing he tithe in, is with Melchizedek. Now, the uh, New Testament nowhere specifically commands tithing, but it does speak of tithing as a good thing. And the New Testament does speak with great clarity on the principle of giving. Talks a lot about that. Where we were, Gene and I, last week in Fairfield, in 1 Corinthians, well, we read it, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Might as well read it and just talk about it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside, something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there may be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So Paul here, talking about more of an offering, not tithing, but just we need a collection. We've talked about that. You guys said you wanted to do that. So do that before I come. Paul's thinking, I'm going to show up and just be all about money. And that will be the reputation I have. So you guys take care of that. Collect what you're going to collect for the saints. But what it says here, that it makes it clear to me this there's really four steps about our giving that we ought to consider. First of all, it needs to be periodic, done at regular intervals. It should also be proportional, giving in proportion to our blessing. It should be planned, thought of in advance, when you come together on the first day of the week. You know that idea in that, that passage. And it also should be private. It's not done to impress anybody. It's not done to show anything. And personally, I have no idea what anybody gives. I have none. I, I have no, so I don't know what you're doing. But anyway, these four steps, these four principles, I think it's good. Periodic, planned, proportional, and private. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 9 also tells us that giving must be three things. Generous, freely given, and cheerfully given. And I think those are all good principles when it comes to but God doesn't want anybody giving grudgingly. He doesn't want anybody disappointed. He wants us to be generous. You know, that we give more rather than less. Freely given. Have you been there where you, people are manipulating? Where they're trying to squeeze the dollar? You know, I've been there where, all right, everybody, hold up your wallets. You hold up your wallet. All right, now reach in there and take something out of it. So you reach in. And I don't want to see any of those George Washingtons. You know, we need some, you know, I've been there, you know. Take your wallet out, throw it in the basket, it's coming around, you know. The manipulation I've seen um, as a Christian is horrible. And I can see why it turns people off. And yet, if we plan ahead, which I have always done, nobody's going to manipulate me into giving more than what the Lord has put in my heart to give. And so that's what I've always done. Not out of guilt, not from manipulation, but cheerful. 
you know, giving happily, rejoicing in the Lord. That's the idea. And I think giving a tithe or giving 10% is a good benchmark. But certainly for some people, that's just the beginning of their giving. Some people, you know, God is, it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, actually, is giving. Some people, God has just blessed them with the ability to make money and, and be able to then share more than what he says. But it's been my conviction for a long time that 10% of anything I receive, I tithe, I have for many, many years. But beyond that, there are also offerings. And offerings are the, my conviction, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain it when we get to verse 10, but my conviction has always been, my church where I am receives the tithe. Anything else that I'm led to give is an offering. It goes above that 10%. It goes, uh, the other 90% I have, those resources, to other organizations. And there's some very good parachurch ministries. I you know, giving to Christian Radio, what a thing. Or a Pregnancy Resource Center. Or uh, Samaritan's Purse. I mean, there's some great places where we can give to. But to me, that's always over and above that 10% because verse 10 says bring all the tithes into the storehouse and people debate what the storehouse is pretty, pretty clear to me that it's your local church it's a church you call home bring tithes there why? that there may be food in my house and in the Old Testament the purpose of the Tithe was primarily to provide for, to support the priest who ministered before the Lord, and for the maintenance of the building and things like that. And that same principle carries over to the New Testament. It does require resources to do the work of the ministry. In the book of Nehemiah, if you were to read that book, and we'll read a passage in Nehemiah 13. But Nehemiah, he just had a burden. He's, he's with the captivity. He's gone. He's in... Um, it's actually beyond the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. But he uh, heard how broken down Jerusalem was as you read the book. and he, So he has a burden to go back. But he's a cupbearer of the king. And he's in the presence of the king. And you're not supposed to be upset when you're in the presence of the king, but he was. He's just dwelling on how the report he received from Jerusalem was so horrible, and how bad it was. So he asked the king, the king said, we well, you know, being upset in my presence, I'm paraphrasing greatly, but, you know, he said, I prayed quick to God, and then I just said, well, why shouldn't I be? And he explained what was going on. He said, well, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to go back. I want to help the people. And the king allowed him to go. And he went and he built the wall and he restored order and did a lot of things, uh, set a lot of things up to restore the proper way of doing things in Jerusalem. And then he goes back because he told the king I would return. So he goes back to Artaxerxes, back to uh, the head, back to the capital of the Medo-Persian Empire where he was. <coughs> and he's there for a while and then he gets leave to go back and check, see how things are going on. And that's what we're going to read about. He, he comes back to Jerusalem. And it's amazing how short a time the things start breaking down. And one of the things it says in Nehemiah 13.10, it says, I also realize, this is Nehemiah speaking, that the portions for the Levites had not been given them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So I contended with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. I think, I, I bet he did. <laughs> then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. So they, they just got to bet, no, do this. Do it and do it how God prescribed it. Because what had happened, the ones who should be doing the work of the ministry, the ones who should be maintaining things, had to go back, had to go out, had to go and work, and couldn't give their full attention to the ministry of the house of the Lord. And Nehemiah sees it, and he says, oh, no, 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 don't be doing that. 
You know that, and that's what we see. God has a purpose to our giving. And it says, though, in the second half of verse 10 back here in Malachi 3, God says, try me now in this. Test me. It's the only place in Scripture where God says to test me. Do you really trust me? God says. Will you do as I command? Will you do as I desire? Will you take all that that I have given to you, a portion, and give it to the ministry of the word? Give it to the advancement of my kingdom. Could God give it directly to the church? I mean, we read in the New Testament, hey Pete, go fishing. That first fish you catch, get the money out of his mouth. I mean, God can do anything, right? But he chooses to use us. It's that way for salvation, to reach the lost. It's that way also for the maintenance of the church. And so he said, test me in this. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Test me. See if it'll work. Unfortunately, I have, as I've mentioned, seen many charlatans who have tried to use that to twist people, to manipulate people, to try to squeeze money out of them. And again, that's never the purpose. There should never be the purpose. We should always purpose in our own heart, in prayer before God, God, what would you have me to do? And then do that. Be obedient. But I think it's pretty clear, as I study tithing over the years, that a tenth is a great place to begin. And if you're not doing that, I encourage you to pray about that and consider that. Test it. Now that, you know, test your motives though too. Because I've also been taught that if I would give a tithe, I would receive a hundredfold back and I'd think, hey, that's a good deal. I'm going to give ten bucks and I'm going to get a grand back. What a wonderful thing, you know. And so I was one of those who would give to get. All right, yeah. You know, this works. It's a test. It's my $10 bill. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> you know, the wrong motive. It wasn't from a generous heart. just wanting to <coughs> give back to what the Lord has given, from what God has given me. Out of joy for the fact that he saved me. It was my own selfish desire. I've done that. But God does plan. God does <coughs> promise. To bless, both with provision and with protection. He's going to provide. He will take care of us. I'm not wealthy. I suppose, and we've talked about this in the past, if you put us on a, a, a level playing field with all the world, we're at the top in America. I mean, we are all wealthy. But in the uh, terms of America, I am not. But yet... That verse that says, I have been young and now I'm old. Never, never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. I can testify to that too. How God has provided. Um, amazingly sometimes. You know, to, to open the mail, there's a check for $3,000 once. And we needed $3,000. It was just amazing. And there was, how God had provided. Or, or when I was laid off and God fired me, you know, like serving full time in ministry, and really what Nehemiah had seen, they'd gone back to the field, they had to go work, and that's where I was at. I need a job, but I, I'm 56 years old. It's 2010, 11, 12, whatever, 2012, I guess. Nobody was hiring 56 year old white guys to do anything. That's when I went to work construction. That was anything. It didn't matter. So there's a job open. So I'll go, sure, I'll take it. But there was a job. I sent out 40 resumes. I didn't get an interview. And it was just a friend said, well, I can give you some work for a few days. Turned into four years. And then the joints were getting a little stressed. The back was getting a little tired. The knees were not bending like they are. St. Joe's, you guys know, I went there, worked there for a couple of years, before the, 
before I hit that magic age of 62 and we sold a house and paid everything off and went to a good place. It's like, gee, I'm going back to work. I'm all done. Why don't you quit with me? She said, no. I said, okay, bye. You know, we'll work. Have a good time. I'm done. seen the faithfulness of the Lord over so many years, I'm not going to take what belongs to him and put it in my pocket. Say, so, God, this is your problem. This is my problem. And he provides. And I know anyone here that ties, they have stories like that. How God has provided for them. So I encourage you. Because he says he's going to bless us. And I'm not saying a blessing is necessarily material. He said he will pour out a blessing. And what is the blessing? I don't know. <coughs> they two sons. They're both in ministry. Is that part of it? I think so. The grandkids, who will, each one has surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. I know that they're saved. Is that part of that blessing? Oh, I think so. You know? It's all material. It's about trusting. I trust the Lord. He has proven it. It's not just that. It says in verse 11 that I will rebuke the power for your sake. But he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine or the bear fruit in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And think of that. Is that not being redundant? That's how I first looked at it. Not destroy the fruit of your ground, or the fruit for you in the field. Then I thought, well, that's, that's not only my home where I live. So help me around the house. Don't break down maybe as easily as the about it in the field, being maybe like where I work or, or outside in the community, in other places, you know, how the, the Lord will use us and allow us to be used and give us influence and how He will keep us safe. I need to claim that in the field. I became a selectman. These people are crazy. <laughs> in these towns, in my Maine. You know, we're not 
some thriving metropolis with billions of dollars we're managing here. It's a small town, you know. Most of it goes to the school budget or the county tax anyway. We don't have control over very reality. Oh boy, oh boy, there's some people think. Help me, Lord. And he does, though. He takes It's a good word and to hear you say about this topic, the top ones of the The Lord is so good. You bless us. If we are not obedient, but we are obedient, abundantly you bless. He comes not but for the kingdom and to speak. Jesus came to have life in that moment. Well, that's my desire, my brothers and sisters here. Bless them. Of abundance, they trust you back to you and to the work that you call them to. What do you call them? What do you call them? Praise Lord. May they be generous and may they trust you. We're going to eat, bless the food, bless our fellow. And, uh, thank you for the truth today as well. In Jesus' name. Well, that's all. Thank you. 